Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the Dryland Cotton Research Association, DCRA, Cotton Seed Distributors, CSD, Ag Econ, and Cotton Info. So today's a great opportunity to look at some of the tools that we can use to help us manage risk in our decisions for rain-fed cotton this coming season. So thanks for joining us. I would like to introduce Angus Marshall from Cottonseed Distributors, and he's going to be giving us a bit of background on our different row configurations. Afternoon, everyone. My name's Angus Marshall. I'm the Extension and Development Agronomist for the Border Rivers, um, St George and Deer and Bandy. Um, I'm just going to run you through some of the basics, type of row configurations, um, some of the considera considerations around row configuration selection, uh, some of the yield potential and comparisons between the different skip row configurations, and then I'll finish on um, CSD's dryland row configuration performance tool. But start off, um, we're not playing with rocket science here, so just the types of row configurations. Um, one of the most common, if not the most common, um, is single skip. So, and similar to single skip is 60 inch. So they both use 66 percent of the planted area. Um, these two skip row configurations have the least risk of losing yield um, in favourable seasons out of all the skip row configurations. Um, however, they will use moisture in the profile the quickest. Um, you've got a metre either side of the cotton plant um, to allow for some root expira uh, expiration zones there. Um, moving into double skip, so 50% of the planted area and similar with 8 inch um, or one in, one out. Um, double skip provides um, a, a bit more risk assurance than single skip um, when seasons are less favourable than, than ideal. Um, again, we've got one and a half metres either side of the, uh, either side of the plant. Um, this configuration is best suited to dry profiles in hotter environments, so the western sort of reaches of, of the dry land growing area. Um, in years that are more favourable, you can get some, some pretty vigorous um, vegetative growth and a little bit of lodging in double skip and 80 inch, um, and then moving into super single. So. There has been a little bit of a super single around in the past couple of seasons. Um, so that's, for those who don't know, single skip is 33% of the planting area or 2.4 metres. Um, this has probably the highest risk of less than favourable conditions um, and is suited to, again, the, the western parts of our growing areas. However, people do grow up throughout those, those cool areas. Um, so getting around Balada and heading further east to Mullally um, and Breeza and do have some pretty successful results. Um, in seasons like we have seen in the past couple of years, however, we can see some pretty vigorous growth again. Um, a bit hard to tell in that picture, but that picture is from a super single crop. Uh, not last season, just gone the season before, and it was it was a massive plant. So it does take a little bit more management in those really, really favourable years. Um, so I'll just touch on some of the considerations for row configuration choice. The obvious ones are your soil type and plant available water capacity. Uh, the wider row configurations you have, the bigger your bucket is in terms of plant available water. Um, a lot of soils with lower plant available water are more suited to your wider row configurations. Um, that's nothing new there. Um, planting wider row configurations in soils with higher plant available water capacity and better wa water holding capacity, sorry, will reduce your risk but may also reduce your yield potential. Um, so in, in seasons, for example, like one was just seen. Some of your agronomic constraints, um, growth hormone management, um, it varies 
fairly significantly between the different row configurations as plant architecture is does vary between the different configurations. Um, for example, for example, you'll typically get a much bigger plant in double skip and 2.4 metres than you will in a single skip scenario or a uh, 60 inch scenario. Um, plants in wider row configurations can be harder to pull up and defoliate in wetter years, um, particularly again those plants in 2.4 metres. Um, there was a lot of crops, particularly um, along the border rivers this year, east of Gundawindi, that really struggled to pull up, especially when they had plenty of nitrogen underneath. Um, and then again, it also comes down to your own personal preference and your own experience between yourself and your agronomist. And the last, another constraint is and that's it can be a pretty big one is um, dependent on type of machinery you have available so it comes down to what your planner can do um, some may be more suited to different row configurations just the way they're set up some planners um, are a lot easier to move your planner boxes around into different configurations than others um, your controlled traffic system so whether you're still on two uh, metre beds or you, you've stretched out to three or four, um, they can also limit what row configurations you use to avoid planting in a tram line. And row configurations such as, such as super single may require some modifications for picking. So typically we pick dry land crops with strippers. Um, however, when we do get really, really big plants in some of the wider row configurations, we may need to use a picker and to pick um, four more rows with a picker, say in 2.4 metres, it will, will require some sort of modification. Um, so again, depending on whether you own your own picker or use a contractor, that can limit what you can do. Um, so now I'll just touch on some yield potentials and some differences between the configurations. Um, this is all for some research done a few years back in with um, CSIRO in collaboration with CRDC and cotton seed distributors. This graph here is just a pretty simple one. Um, the yield from those um, different crops, which you'll see in the next slide, you can see there solid was the highest yield. However, there was some pretty um, some pretty good seasons thrown in there. Like I said, this is some of the information from these trials. Um, you can see there, there's some, some of these crops saw some pretty decent rainfalls, similar to what we've seen this season, where the solid would have been much more suited. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of graphs. This graph is just a bit of an explanation how to read these graphs. So they are on the x-axis there, we've got double skip. On the y-axis, single skip. The orange line would be relative to an equal yield between the two different configurations. If the data points are in the green, it means double skip had a high yield in the scenario. If the data points are in the blue, single skip would have had a high yield in that scenario. So I hope that makes sense to everyone. Um, so just a skip row com uh, comparison related back to solid. So here you can see um, the crossover points about that between 2.1 and 2.6 bales to the hectare from these trials. Um, so what that's saying is that anything less than two bales to the hectare, you're better off with a skip row configuration in those years. Um, anything more then 2.6 bales to the hectare, you're better off in the using a solid configuration. Um, I will note this is only from those trials done over those couple of years. Um, super single versus double skip, again, a pretty similar result um, in scenarios where you're getting less than about two and a half bales to the hectare, you're better off with a super, super single um, skip configuration whereas getting up in those high yields two and a half and above you're better off with a double skip configuration 
Um, I don't think that's surprising. Um, this is an interesting one. This is comparing 80 inch or one in one out to double skip. And it's just showing here that if you can um, accommodate an 80 inch configuration in your dry land, you are going to do just as well as double skip, if not a little bit better. Um, so that's a pretty interesting comparison. What that comes down to, that could be more uniformity across your crop. Um, well, there are a number of other different reasons there. So this is just a quality one I threw in there. Um, this is just a comparison between solid, so one metre, and then all the other skip row configurations. Just shows in terms of quality, um, in this case length, you are always better uh, off with a skip row configuration in a dry land, uh, <coughs> dry land sorry, scenario. I'll just finish off on um, CSD's dry land row configuration performance tool. Uh, this was a tool I helped develop over the past year or so. Um, just gives you an idea of what row configuration may be suited to your scenario. So as you can see there on the left, you can punch in your region, your risk, which comes down to, in a nutshell, it's your, your weather forecast, um, your current plan available water, and estimated planning date. So there's three options for planning date, early, medium, and late. Early is about mid-September through to mid-October. Medium's the next month after that, and late is the following month after that. So what it'll do, it'll give you an optimal configuration based on what you've entered there, and then it'll also give you some data, um, an industry average plus a regional average from your specific region you've selected. Um, this next slide is just so what I've done here is I've changed the risk to medium and lowered the plant available water a little bit. As you can see, it's changed the optimal configuration from a single skip to a double skip or 80 inch scenario. And again, should, um, given that data there. So that's all from me, everyone. If you've got any questions, just throw them in the Q&A section. I'll be happy to answer them over the next couple of presentations. But um, yeah, I'll hand it back to Janelle. So thank you. Thanks very much, um, Angus. So that's just a bit of a, uh, an overview of the configurations that we have and a few of the considerations that you might need to look at in working out which row config configuration you might use on your place. Um, next, we've got Stuart McFadgen, and he's going to be looking at some um, work where we use um, the OSCOP modelling to actually um, look at the risks involved in um, for reaching potential yields for different um, row configurations. So uh, we'll hand over to Stuart. Thanks very much. Thanks, Janelle. Um, yeah, I'm just going to run through the OSCOT crop simulation model, and uh, we've just coupled it with some historical climate records, and um, we're going to use it as uh, to assist in establishing the difference in yield potential and a reliability and a risk tool for drilling between row configurations and regions. Um, it, it allows us to observe impacts um, from adjusting the inputs uh, and what that has say on what the difference a planting time has or starting soil moisture has on a drilling cotton crop. Um, it's important to mention, though, um, how important the soil component is for this model. Um, a lot of the variation we get from the model comes from the variation in the soil water holding capacity. And so making sure you've got that number right is really important for this model. Um, similar graph to what Angus just threw up. Um, a one to one ratio. It just shows us that um, that this model has been validated um, with commercial dry land cotton crops of various row configurations. Um, so there's little little doubt about the accuracy of the model. It's uh, it's more important about the inputs that we put into it to make sure that it, um, it gives us an accurate result. So um, we've run the model for 65 seasons. Um, and you can see here for the slide at Dalby, 
um, the last 65 seasons at 250 millimetres of plant available water capacity, and that's to a depth of 1.5 metres. Um, there is some variability, so it's important to think of the model as uh, a risk and potential tool. And um, the data that I've uh, generated from the model, I've graphed it as a box and whisker graph uh, in Excel. So I want you to um, just focus on the box part of the graph because that's where 50% of the values land. And there's also a 75% chance of exceeding the, the bottom of that box um, as we go up. Um, and the other thing I will mention too is that sometimes um, the model does throw out some outliers. So into the, um, into the data, um, if we first look at the plan available water capacity um, and its impact on yield, we've chosen uh, 200 mils uh, of water holding capacity for Balata and a 250 millimetre as a comparison. And uh, we've just gone a little bit more for Dolby, uh, given their soils they've got there. And, uh, and when the soil moisture profile is full, um, you can see uh, the, the impact that has on yield forecast for that region. Uh, and it's a bit over a bale for Balata and just slightly less for Dolby. Um, however, if that profile wasn't full and uh, it was only, you know, say 50%. Again, um, similar scenario, single skip, uh, planted on the 30th of October. Um, you can see the the spread of the box is is greatly increased. And we've also got for the 250 mil, um, the the model's telling us that it actually the yield potential is a bit lower than the 200 mil for Balata. And just thinking why that would be, I don't doubt the model, it's just when does the rain fall for this region and what does that mean for, for crops sown on half a profile um, in that area? And I think what's happening is um, these crops are probably getting further into flowering and bowl set by the time they're hitting the wall, as opposed to the 200 mils, which might be going into stress a little bit earlier. Um, and so when the rain does turn up, um, so, you know, over the 65 seasons we've run this model for Balata, um, I think that this soil is, this crop in this soil is just able to bounce back a little bit better um, for this, for this scenario. So, if your break even, depending on what the prices are for, for the season, if your break even is below two bales, you might just reconsider your options here um, for the Balata site. However, you can see that Dolby, um, the way the rain falls there, it's, um, it's a little bit different. So um, the season is still quite favourable there. So when we go, uh, to changing the row spacings for the Balata site. Uh, the 200 millimetre soil water holding capacity, the double skip, slightly in front of the single skip in this scenario, um, less downside and slightly better upside. When we increase that water holding capacity to 250 mil, the inverse occurs. So it just shows us that the single skip, uh, less downside, a bit more upside uh, for that site. Um, I've included the solid here as well. Um, so this year it's worked out um, solid plantings at Balata have, have performed quite well. Um, you can see, I think the data might be um, helped out by a couple of outliers in that scenario. Uh, however, Quality issues uh, with this row spacing uh, is something that you should definitely consider, and Janine will probably touch on that um, a little bit later in the in the presentation. Uh, the model also allows us to change the sowing dates, so um, early in this early, we'll say mid September, early in the sowing window, 
there's plenty of variability in in what the model's throwing up. It's worth noting though, uh, so this is a metre and a half row spacings and I've brought the soil water holding capacity back to 200 mils uh, for all sites, just to even that up. Um, plenty of variability at the start of the window. Um, however, we've got about two months worth of acceptable sowing, uh, uh, pretty good planting. Uh, well, the model is telling us that there's two months worth of um, good results uh, through the middle of that planting window before things start to deteriorate and really throw up more variability um, as we get into December. And uh, just lastly, um, to try and find out more information um, about either uh, this program, um, a lot of this data is presented in the Australian Cotton Production Guide in Chapter 4, and I've just included a couple of screenshots of, of the manual there and the pages that are relevant to it. You can go to the CSD website. Um, there's also the Acres of Opportunity website. Um, there is a model, uh, used to be called Whopper Cropper. Um, now you can find that at, at armonline.com.au. And I'd also recommend that you um, have a look at the BOM website too. Um, just to familiarise yourself with um, uh, the forecast for that as well. Um, Stuart, just to um, clarify, if I'm, you showed some data there from Ballada and Dolby, but if I am from another region and I was wanting to get um, some similar data out of those models, um, where's the best place to look for that information? Uh, so I would go to Australian Cotton Production Guide, um, Chapter 4. Um, you can look up your, your site there. Um, uh, yeah, that'd be that'd be my first option, I reckon. Um, there's The model has been run for the different sites um, in that chapter, so you can definitely um, get a lot more information out of that. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Yeah, just having a look there on um, chapter four in the dry um, the dry land chapter of the Australian Cotton Production Manual. Yeah, there's the model's been run um, from Hilston up to Emerald. So um, have a look in that chapter for your own regions as well for some of that data to help you with your decisions. Thanks, Stuart. We also okay. have. Um, uh, Mike Banj is on today from um, CSD and he's the fellow that actually runs the model. So, Mike, I'm just going to throw you in this at the moment because um, you said that you've had quite a few people calling you about some of this output. So can you just give us a bit of a rundown on on what, what people are after when, when they're contacting you at the moment with regards to the OSCOP modelling? Oh, oh, good afternoon, everyone. And Thanks, Janelle, for throwing me in, in the deep end. I was hoping to sit in the background and, and have a day off. Uh, look, you know, honestly, this was sort of this sort of information is the sort of information that uh, certainly new growers and growers looking to change uh, configurations and that are often uh, used to throw at me in terms of trying to understand, you know, what, what was the value and what are the risks related to these things. So we do have, you know, uh, potential for a fairly large rain fed season ahead of us and and certainly some of those areas you know looking to grow cotton for the first time and decisions about what configurations uh, to grow are often complex uh, because they do pertain to you know uh, the relative yield differences between configurations uh, there are definite ris risks associated with it and the and the and and what outputs and what results you get you know did you know are different when you when you change sowing time and, and those sort of things. So these things help to get some data to help you think about that, notwithstanding the complexities that, you know, Angus pointed out around machinery and, and systems. So it, it's all about just giving you some quant, quantifiable data to, to, to assist with that decision making. And uh, yeah, been getting those, those questions, you know, and you know, these are all simulations. A lot of the simulations that have been presented here today are those things that I've done for growers in those regions, you know, over the last 20 years in terms of you know, these exact questions that people people were asking. Um, 
Yeah, often often what changes are, are the things that Janelle was about to talk about in terms of price and uh, you know costs that often have changed that dynamic. But I, I, I'd emphasise, you know, why Angus is giving you the crossover uh, between different configurations and and the and Stu's giving the risk for those sort of things. You know, you can basically take those da that data, couple it with Janelle's and your own own data, and work out where those you know those differences occur. Um, yep. So I'll hand back Thanks, to you, Mike. Janelle. Right here. Thanks very much, Mike. And um, and I won't take any credit for all the economics. That would be Janine. So well done, Janine. And um, well, off we go with your section. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it was great to hear from Angus and Stuart for some of the tools that we can look to for uh, trying to estimate our forward or next season yields and some of the complex agronomic factors and considerations there are when you're looking to select some row configurations. Um, I'm just going to stick to some of the more traditional row configurations, but I'm also going to run through and show you how you can use this gross margin analysis and kind of make it your own for regardless of the row configurations you are looking at. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the Cotton Info Gross Margin Budgets as the basis for the analysis. Uh, these budgets are updated every second year, so they're updated uh, last year and I'm one of the main ones that goes through and uh, does the updating of those and they are funded by CRDC. Um, I find the easiest way to find them is just Google Cotton Info Gross Margin Budgets and I'll pop you straight to the page with the most up-to-date um, budgets and there's quite a few of them there. In terms of dry land, there is a one for Northern Australia as well as a general one for the Eastern States. So because obviously these budgets can't be created specific to a farm, there's just so many different operations and ways that you can grow a cotton crop. Obviously the farmer knows what their soils and their different operations, their, um, their climates are, it just varies so much. So these budgets need to be used, they're indicative, they should have a pretty good um, idea of costings in them, but then what you do is you just alter the different operations and inputs to suit your specific situation. So in terms of the rain fed gross margins um, for the different row configurations, there are some similarities. So some of the costs are the same across each of the row configurations. So for example, your fallow management or your uh, post crop farming or some of the late stage crop sprays, which need to be a blanket spray if you've got full canopy cover um, in some of your skip situations. Then of course, there are the costs that are very dependent on your row configuration. So they'll be based on potentially yield targets or that plant growth and canopy cover is a big one for basically what your bandwidth on your spray is going to be. In Within the gross margins, you can consider risk. So I think both Angus and Stuart touched on some of the risks of quality in a rain fed or dry land situation um, and so by putting in associated disc a quality discount you can consider some of your risk in that way. So the final gross margins and the differences between the row configurations essentially will come down to your lint price received with consideration of discounts and the weather effect on yield. So hopefully they're the the biggest um, factors in the gross margins, but we're going to go through them. So screen's probably a bit too small for many of you to see, but what I'm looking at here is the, um, the green sections of the areas within this comparison. So I've got single skip is the first um, column here, then double, then solar just for comparison. So where it's green, the costs have remained the same. So the budgets are done on a, a physical hectare, not a green hectare. And um, then where I haven't highlighted, it's just different. So it's just to show that some of the costs are going to be the same regardless of row configuration, and some of them are going to be 
dependent on, so for these sprays, dependent on um, your canopy cover there. So that would be something that you could look through. You could look up the industry gross margins and you can start going, oh, look, no, for me, I would change this or I would actually have a, a narrower band on these. I can change that down. My costs might be different if I'm using a contractor for some of these operations. Um, and you can go through and kind of play with the costs and make the budgets a bit more your own. So what we did look at was Balata, and I've got in here um, in the solid yield, the skip yield and the double skip yields, they go through the model and you'll see, um, you can see some of the results. So they're the Balata median yields. So as Stuart was saying, the median is 50% of the time the yields will be above this, 50% of the time yields will be below this. Um, so this is across all plant dates. As you shift or look at specific plant dates, the relationship between your row configurations will change. We're looking at a plant available water content of 200 and we're assuming full profile at plant. So obviously this is a pretty uh, strong scenario uh, in terms of profile, obviously can only get worse from there. And some of the other factors that we're looking at, for example, the cotton lint price of what we're looking at roughly around the moment in that just over that $600 a bale is also, it's certainly not conservative. Uh, whether or not we think this time next year we'll have $600 a bale, let's hope so. Um, I'm just pointing out some of the things that show this is, uh, you would say, a, a fairly positive budget. So these are the things that you can change yourself as well. Um, in terms of discounts, and this is to reflect some of the yield risk that are associated with the different row configurations. So for the solid, the solid yield, we've got a discount in there of $135 a bale. Now, sometimes that mightn't be a high enough discount. In the poor seasons, if you've got a lot of strength and potentially mic um, issues, coupled on each other, there's we've certainly seen uh, discounts higher than that um, in terms, of, but it, then in some some seasons where you've had the Goldilocks effect and it's been perfect rain and not too much, there hasn't been any water logging, you mightn't necessarily see these discounts. Um, but as yeah, Angus and Stuart both went through that in terms of row configurations, you're much more likely to see a um, yield issues with the solid. So we've got the $135 a bale discount associated with the solid. We've got $25 a bale associated with single and we've got no discount associated with the double. So that's the differences that we've put in there and to consider the uh, the quality risk with those row configurations. So once you look at your yield with your income um, or your your eventual price, so that 568 is the solid, um, particularly that one, because I've just added in some of the other ones, but you can look across them here and go for your final incomes per hectare, whoops. And then the operations that we looked at before um, in the previous slide are summarized here for single, double and solid. And collectively, then we look down your income minus your costs, is your gross margins per hectare. So in this scenario, the double skip has come out as the highest gross margin per hectare. It was very marginally the lower yield, but once the different discounts were applied to the price of the single and the solid, it's come out as a higher gross margin per hectare. So what this really does highlight is the yield isn't the only consideration. We need to look at some of these other risks. 
We've then got the single skip, which has come out as a bit lower than double, but still pretty healthy. And then further down again is the solid gross margin at 867 hectare. So this is at the median yield. So you're saying 50% of the time based on yield alone, they get it, the gross margins per hectare will be higher than these figures and 50% of the time they'll be lower than these figures. The break-even yields can be quite handy to look at. So what these are, if you're assuming everything else stays the same, so particularly the price, that's an important thing. If that stayed the same, to break even with these costs, these and these discounts and incomes, this is the break even yields, yields you need. So with the highest gross margin per hectare in the double skip, you need the lowest yield to break even. And then because of the risks with quality and discounts for solid, you'd need the highest and single skip, um, you're gonna need it's in a midway point. Uh, look, some of you are probably thinking 633, I would never budget on that. So you can look at then some of these break even prices, assuming all things remain equal. So the yields remain the same and you can show the required break even price. Double skip requires the lowest cotton uh, lint price and inclusive of discounts. And because of the associated discounts, these, the plant, uh, solid plant needs the highest break even price. So obviously these yields are not the only ones that are possible. So I've run a number of scenarios. So staying with bladder at this point, we can see the relationship between the double skip, which we saw on the previous page had the highest gross margin per hectare. In the very best seasons, the single skip is popping above the double skip. Um, so what I've done here is 90% of the time results will fall along that line. 5% of the time they'll fall below, 5% of the time they will they'll be above. So you and all these are based on the 633 bale. You might be looking at this and thinking, okay then, what happens if my price is 533? Well, you'd see a sh complete shift in all the lines just moving down and these bottom 5% of the time would all probably get then below zero that they haven't broke even. But the relationship between your different row configurations doesn't change with the change of price. So that's important to know. So looking at the double skip, which was on the previous page at that median price, the, um, the preferred option, over here, you can see these are the yields that have come out of Oscott and that um, Stuart had displayed earlier. So 90% of the time, the yields are going to be between 2.6 and 6.98 bales per hectare on the double skip. And that equates to $645 per hectare to $2,940 per hectare. So we've got the different ranges and associated with the different yields. If you were in the surrounding region to Balata and were thinking, how can I use this information for this coming season? Uh, noting that we're looking at plan of available water content of 200 for the soil and a full profile. You might consider how changing that might change your yields. So if you, with lower starting soil moistures, you're going to have likely shifting the yields down. So then all of your, and it just depends then also, you might wanna look at, use some of the tools and the cotton production manual to look at how the relationship between the row configurations change. Um, and then in terms of yield, and then that will change the relationship in terms of the gross margin as well. So that's Balata. 
the same then um, situation and same uh, method is used for Dolby. So you can see there is actually, um, in terms of the gross margin, a bit of a different relationship between the row configurations. Um, in the poorer years, the single skip is the higher performer um, compared to the other two. In the 50% uh, probability there, the single skip is still marginally higher with the double skip um, and solid pretty similar. And then in these more unusual years, so 90% 90, 90 of the time, it's going to be worse than that. But in that the best 5% of years, you might see solid coming out on top. So it's interesting to see, obviously, we're talking about um, higher plant uh, water holding capacity of these soils. And they're starting with the full capacity. It's different climates and different um, yield relationships. So it's pretty important to look at what is appropriate for your particular region. Also then included Walgett. Um, and that's got a different relationship again. We've got the double skip again is at 50% of the time is going to be just ahead of the single skip. Um, in the poorer years, we've got the single skip coming out ahead. And then the single skip and the solid essentially, you'd almost on par then, um, even at those upper best years. So it just goes to show that you'll, when you're looking at the different row configurations, having some consideration of what your um, outlook is going to be is pretty important. And but you're not just thinking about the best years, where that's what we hope for. We also need to plan for some of the the worst or the poorest scenarios, if we get a surprise hot January and with no rain, what that's going to do to your yield and some of these poor ends and risk minimisation um, is also what a lot of the decisions are about. So, Janine, we've just got a question actually. Oh, sure. You've yeah, well, that was basically me done, but I'm happy to go back to any slides based on any questions. Um, so, Rob Beverly, you've got a question. Um, you've unmuted and go ahead. Um, it actually wasn't specifically to Janine, <laughs> but um, it was more about, um, I guess, uh, the models are great, uh, but really coming up with some recommendations that take into consideration um, the seasonal uh, prospects. So, what the SOI is or, or yeah putting together that information from the, the most likely seasonal um, prospects, which I know aren't perfect, with planting date, which is something that's difficult to, as a dryland grower, to uh, to get, uh, say, I'm going to plant on that particular date. It's more when the planting rain arrives, uh, along with row configuration. So can we manage those three things together to give someone uh, the ideal row configuration to go for, given those parameters? I'm going to um, say I think right that's, to that's an Angus question probably and some of the tools that he was going through somewhat covered that. Yeah, so Rob, um, mate, we've got a dryland row configuration performance um, tool on the CSD website where you can whack in your planning date. Um, it's not specific. It's basically broken down into um, early, medium and late. Um, early is from September through to October, mediums the month after that, late the month after that again. Um, you can put in your risk and then you can't um, plan available water and it'll spit out a optimal row configuration. So there's not a whole lot of detail there, but it does give you an idea of some of the yields of previous crops, um, mostly CSD variety trials um, from those situations. It, and gives you a little bit of data there as well. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, mate. Thanks, Angus. Yeah, no, I did see that, but does, does it also have a, um, it, you know? Uh, yeah, I'm going to ask 
Um, Rob, I think what you're after, and I, I think Mike might be able to answer that in terms of the forecasting ability of uh, Auscot. Uh, so really interesting question about seasonal forecasts, you know, matching with the model and uh, certainly have tried that over a number of years. You know, uh, I can say that there, 15 years ago, we used to run the model and actually choose, you know, SOI phases based on, you know, uh, the phase um, phase forecasting system based on the SOI, you know, rapidly rising, negative, positive, uh, rapidly declining and neutral. Uh, the thing that I can say is that uh, some of those forecasts, we didn't actually, we haven't experienced enough of those seasons, believe it or not, to actually make them actually in many ways statistically sound, you know, to make a call that one, one phase is actually better than the other. Now, when we talk about the SOI, the one thing that's changed associated with climate change is that forecast is becoming less relevant, uh, as certainly in this area, as we move you know, forward in time. So there is some certainly some dangers. Now, the, the reality is, though, that often with those forecasts, the same level of uncertainty exists um, with those forecasts. So as you've pointed out, it doesn't matter what forecast we have, we can have the most positive forecast and still end up with um, you know, the same um, low end in terms of yield. So it's, it's about reducing that risk over the forecast and, and managing irreducible uncertainty. Um, now, in saying that, the one thing that hasn't been tried in recent years is the use of the access to um, numerical forecasts that's come out of the Bureau, and that may be a, a topic for future research in terms of linking the model with with those new forecasts that are coming from the Bureau, and they may much much may be much more precise. But I can say SOI phases are not something that uh, is necessarily recommended anymore in terms of uh, um, going forward in, in these things. But it's been tried, um, and I think I can remember when it did when the forecast worked it was actually on a rapidly rising forecast that there was more chance of getting a uh, more chance of getting a lower uh, sorry a higher uh, bottom end to the to the end of those box and wisp graphs that you you know that Angus I'm sorry Stu showed so yep it can be done but uh, you know the, the thing about rain for cotton that risk is always there thank you so there's a fair bit to take into account and I guess today we've just been able to show you some tools to actually just help with some of those decisions. There's no proper recipe or silver bullet for your choice of row configuration. There's because of the number of variables that, that you need to take into account. Thank you very much to our presenters today, Angus Marshall, Stuart McFadgen and Janine Powell. Um, I'd like to thank Janine for all the work that Ag Econ have done with funding through CRDC to pull together the gross margin budgets for industry, because I think they're one of the most downloaded fact sheets off the Cotton Info website. So um, yeah, no, thank you for, uh, uh, for doing that important work for the industry. Just to let you know that I'm actually filling in for Annette McCaffrey, who is the Executive Officer for the DCRA, the Dry Land Research Cotton Association. And it was having trouble with the internet, so I've jumped in to just facilitate this meeting. But um, thanks very much to Annette for helping pull this meeting together as well. If you're interested in becoming a member of the DCRA, um, please contact um, Annette. And it's all about just bringing relevant and current information to um, for rain-fed cotton growers. So thanks again, and um, we'll say good afternoon. Thank you.